it's time to do business. This time we have 55 minutes to go around the world of business. And here's what we have prepared for you on this episode of Business Incorporated. Good news in Kenya, inflation eases to 3.6%. That's for the month of September. Even more good news expected. The wheat, wheat prices are expected to fall. And finally, we will give you highlights from that channel's forum, which through which we celebrate said the 64th anniversary independence of Nigeria. I mean, John Rekwad, let's do business. Starting from the global space, oil prices ticked high in early trade on Thursday as investors weighed the escalating conflict in the Middle East and the potential for disruption to crude flows against an ample supplied global market. And so we see 64 cents is what has been added to uh, Brent. So that's about 0.87 percent to $74.54 a barrel. WTI, just a little bit less than that in value, about 72 cents, but more than 1% increase uh, on the price, $70.82 a barrel. As expected, major driver is attention going on in the Middle East. To remember that uh, Iran had drawn, been drawn into the conflict. They sent about 180 ballistic missiles at Israel, uh, escalating the hostilities in that region. We're still in the global space now discussing metal gold prices. We're trading in a tight range on first day as traders remained on the sidelines ahead of the U.S. economic data expected. I think jobs data is expected tomorrow, Friday, and this can provide clues about the size of Federal Reserve's interest rate cut that is expected later on this year. I know we experienced one cut already, 50 basis points. So we see the numbers now. Spot gold is unchanged, $2,655.03. U.S. gold features went up $2,675.40 after it had gone up by that. So looking at other metals, spot silver went down in the red, 0.9%, $31.58 per ounce. Platinum also down 0.5%, palladium down. Um, a lot of uncertainty there, waiting for those data. You know, when it gets close to Friday, uh, a lot of data expected from the United States. Jobless data, uh, jobless claims data is one of that. And uh, services data is also expected. So a barrage of uh, data expected from uh, the government uh, from the United States. Now, back here in Nigeria, the Bank of Industry has launched a mobile app that's supposed to check the cost of food prices across eight states in the country. The states uh, that the app will operate in are Lagos, Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, Rivers, Oyo, Enugu, Kano, and Plateau. The web version uh, of that uh, app, PriceSense.com. NG. It's also help users check the wholesale and retail prices of food items, uh, basic commodities, rice, beans, tomato, maize, and others across different countries. So you can know uh, if you're on the right stead or not, or if, uh, as a lot of uh, parties have uh, alleged, the middlemen are adding some prices to what it's supposed to be. Now, the chairman of Odua Investment Company Limited, Otumba Bimbashiru, is challenging Nigerians to believe in the country and hold fast to the promises of President Bola Tinubu. Mr. Ashiru, who was speaking to our correspondent in Lagos, says he believes that the ongoing economic reforms will yield gains. Most of these policies, they are tough ones. And it's just like um, when you start make a policy, even in your home, when you make some laws that look this, you know, it's, we are going to feel the pains, I can tell you that. But I can see the new policies that are being, have been coming up now, that our payments, settlements, will now be in Naira. It will strengthen our currency. Because when you say payment balance of settlement should be done in foreign exchange, in dollars, then it put pressure on our Naira because you need now start looking for dollars. And so many, it's a lot of supply and demand and supply. So if the demand outweighs supply, then there will be scarcity, there will be pressure on that thing. So I foresee a strong Naira in the next future, in the nearest future, hopefully by first quarter or second quarter of next year. For example, in the matter now, you pay you pay Naira. Dangote refineries, once you supply this, you pay Naira. So, and I always tell people, Nigeria has no business 
being an import dependent economy. We should be exporting a lot of things out of this country. And with that, we bring in so many foreign exchange. And I will tell you, because there's so much Naira in the system, the general rate is going up. So people were wondering, talking about the interest rate. Yes, once the interest rate come, goes up, it mops up the liquidity. People will now probably put play in the money market. Because that is the only way to do things. Once I mean, the interest rate will attract you. You put so much money in the in the bank. The liquidity, we I mean, we 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 pay for up and CBN we mop it up by selling treasury bills and um, long-term treasury bills. But the point is this: one thing that is important is we Nigerians must be ready to be loyal to this country. I mean, an average American will say, "Oh, my country, my country," because they believe that their country is taking care of them. So we must have that culture that, oh, Nigeria is our country. Yeah, Nigeria is our country and we should love Nigeria. Now, Nigeria Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, that's the SEC, they're joining their counterparts in the International Organization of Securities Commissions to celebrate the eighth edition of World Investor Week. Events slated for this year will run from October 7 to 13 with the theme focus on technology and digital finance, crypto assets, and sustainable finance. The Executive Commissioner, Legal and Enforcement at the Securities and Exchange Commission, Frana Chukwogo, was on the business morning earlier and says that investors will get tips for safe investment. If you're a registered scheme, of course you are registered, and you've gone through some kind of process to be sure that you're fit and proper, whether it's you, the person providing the service or is the product that you're bringing into the market. But for a Ponzi scheme, there's no registration, there's no vetting. These are just schemes that collect money from investors. First comers have the opportunity to be paid with money collected from later investors. These investments offer very high returns and there's no consequent risk. There's no investment that can give you such high return without any risk. So if anybody is approaching any investor, offering you any investment that has very high returns, and there's no risk that has been disclosed, the investor would have to be worried. If you cannot find this in particular uh, service provider or anybody offering you investment, So watching business incorporated right here on channel television well i'm being flagged by beautiful ladies in here because we're discussing a uh, global gender gap and we're talking about empowering women so not surprising that we have right here in the studio uh you know her as waji <laughs> well she's a tuaji irobe and her beautiful daughter yes that's her daughter not her sister <laughs> emerald uh, good to have you ladies in the studio good afternoon thank and you, welcome thank you you I'm great, thank you. Great. So uh, we're discussing the issue of empowering women, and we see Nigeria is currently ranked as 125th out of 146. Yeah. So we're really down there, mm -hmm. you know, um, in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. We've been talking about gender equality. In mm -hmm. fact, sometimes now people say the women are getting so empowered and we're forgetting the men. Mm. <laughs> but um, do you see that has the society grown? Um, to a stage where we can say women are actually being given, or not maybe not being given, but being allowed to take their place. Let's start with Wajay. <laughs> well, I, I, I even think that using the word allowed is, um, for lack of a better word, is, is weird. Because I, I, outside gender, right, I feel like every human being, every individual is created to reach their maximum potential, regardless of whether they're male, male or female, right? So I don't think that anybody should be allowed to, I feel like the same access, you know, are our brothers and uncles and fathers and every, you know, like the male gender, the same access they have, the women should be allowed to have that. So in my own opinion, um, 125 out of, 100. Out, out, out of 146 is pretty low, you know, because you also have different scenarios of women who um, are breadwinners or women who, you know, life has happened and they have to be the one to 
kind of lead, then what happens to them? Should them being female or being women stop them from actually being able to provide mm -hmm. or an outside provision? Um, you know, just the, the, the fun of having a dream and fulfilling your dream, you know, as, as a human being. First of all. Yeah, but but you know in Africa, I mean not just Nigeria, in Africa, I know it's not so long ago we had the story of the Kenya athletes. Yes. Uh, athletes. Yes. Because of land ownership. Yes. You know, so I mean oh, it is sad for, for, for Africa and it does seem that we, we still have a long way to go. But uh, let me speak to your your personal experience. I guess right. that's one of the reasons you're here, to share your personal experience. Being a woman, right. yeah. a single mother, and yeah. you're able to bring up this beautiful <laughs> girl yes. um, going through school. You talked about empowerment. And mm -hmm. yes, there's the passion of individuals being allowed, if I could say, mm -hmm. to fulfill destiny, to fulfill the, uh, you know, leave out the talents that have been given to them. That's on the one hand. But there's also the thing of necessity. Mm -hmm. So you're a mother. You have to take care of her for, absolutely. for, for, for years. Yeah. You obviously need to be financially stable yeah, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Was it easy? Oh, definitely not easy. But I, I, yeah, it wasn't easy. But I'll still shout out to the other women who kind of gave me the opportunity, right? So when you sit down in tables or have these kinds of conversation, you find out that it's actually the numbers that make, you know, whatever success story you're trying to gun for is the numbers that make it possible, right? If a few women haven't run, how will you sprint? You know, if they haven't walked, how would you run, you know? So um, for, my, for me, my own experience wasn't exactly easy, but I, shout out to my mom. My mom is a very hardworking person woman and she, I, I grew up seeing her like that and not just her her sister because she has a sister her sister was like that so I grew up with the mindset of different revenue streams of income because I understood the freedom that that gives so I'm a musician but I'm also doing other things I also have a match I also I'm um, think you know once in a while I do real estate buy land here sell it in a few years you know different things to make sure that you are consistently free you know to explore whether it's a necessity or it, it's purpose, at least you have the freedom to explore. Yeah. So I wonder what Emerald has learned watching mommy and grandmommy, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. all through. And I'm sure by now you have your own at least one stream of income. Yeah. Mm, tell us about it. Um, okay, now I, I'm a new graduate, so I have a job now and I earn a salary. So it's from my salary that I provide for myself because mm -hmm. I don't get allowance from my mom anymore. <laughs> like wow. the way she says, <laughs> provide for my She's okay. telling the world okay. that okay. mommy has got me off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Gonna, like literally immediately, immediately I finished me. Okay. Yeah, and that was important for me to do because I needed to teach her that, yeah. you know, even though you come from, you know, some some way other people would say privileged, you yeah. know, you come from a privileged background because I feel like I, I did a lot of things for her not to have to do, mm -hmm. you know, like, so yeah, you come from privilege and, you know, you schooled abroad and the reason why it was very deliberate. So you have access, you have all that, but there's a time when you now have to be the person mm -hmm. who creates that kind of security for yourself yeah. right mm -hmm. you know and yeah. which is one of the reasons why you know when when we started having the conversation about coming here today i wanted her to be a part of it mm -hmm. because we have to start creating generational wealth as women and her money her power is that her money her power is not just about creating wealth for you but passing it on to other women you know so that our gdp you understand the gap <laughs> when they now say one twenty six percent you're not thinking oh why are women why are we lacking behind because you're mm. seeing more women who are giving that sort of access you know what i mean mm. so yeah. so so uh, there's also the multiplier effect you right know, with women that women reinvest up to 90 percent of their income absolutely into I agree. their families yeah now how does a woman um because sometimes it, it does seem hard for a woman you just want to take care of your children, your yeah. husband, you know, take care of the home front. Yeah. How do you detach or balance that with, I need to invest for the future? Because a man will always, if he has money, he'd set this for the home, he's investing the rest, he's, do you understand? But mm -hmm. a woman will get sentimental, oh, I yeah. remember my, my daughter's sandals, they're getting old, I need 
you, you know, something like that. And and to be fair, my ex my experience was exactly like that, right? Um, I'm the firstborn of my family, so in my mind, I always felt that whatever I received, I had to, you know, create businesses for other people, do this, sort out this, sort out that. But as you grow, you realize that if you are not fully standing, right, you can't really help people. Do you understand what I mean? And so it's same thing for the family. So if you're in that kind of situation, I would I would think that the woman who is thinking generational wealth will, will prioritize and no, nobody's saying don't take care of your family but we're saying when, when is it what kind of business should you invest in we, are you going to invest in stocks how much of your income are you going to invest right are you going to save how much of your savings are you I, what and what are you going to prioritize at the time so if i'm thinking sandals for my daughter how many times should i buy sandals in a month can mm. can we reduce the sizes of sandals till i make enough for me to splurge yeah. and you know these are things that we start thinking about so we can eventually we can retire early we can you know take care of a family with ease rather and than we can go on vacation uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> like we were talking about now like it's vacation time <laughs> so you keep talking about generational um wealth and all of that but i mean in Nigeria, the true picture, I mean, even the uh, CBN has said only about 45% financial inclusion mm -hmm. for women. And mostly it's like you see the women in the very small businesses. Yeah. You go to the market, yeah. smallholder, farmers. So how do you build generational wealth from something like that? Hmm. Because a, a lot of women do not want their children, as you said, you don't want them to pay the price you have paid. Absolutely. You don't want your child to go and sit down and sell tomatoes, for Absolutely. instance. You understand? But if she has to, then she has to. Ah, nice one. Yeah. <laughs> Emerald, did I you have get to that? Sell my tomato. <laughs> if she has to, then she has to. But um, I think that um, generational wealth for for us women is also educating women on you know how to create that wealth let me tell you why i say this um when she was younger i i subscribed her to a financial platform that would teach her certain things about and to be honest she didn't understand it at the time but in my mind i was like this is what i know mm. Maybe if I had a mentor or someone, you know, that can teach me other ways, I would have been able to, you know, probably do something else that maybe was grander. Until I now listen to Ibukon Wulua Oshik, I think she was the one who said something about her son when he turned 21. And um, she asked him, a Rolex or a financial advisor? What will you choose? And he thought about it and said, a Rolex. And so when she turned 21, I asked her the same question. But in my mind, I already knew that, you know, I knew where I was pushing her towards because um, to create that wealth and generational wealth, you have to make sure that the person who is coming up in the next generation learns from your mistakes. Mm. I'm always screaming in the house. Mm. She will tell you, save, because she likes fashion. She likes to buy clothes. She likes all that. But as she's buying clothes, I tell her, save, well, because me, I don't give allowance anymore. But we live in the same house. At least I'm helping her with rent and food. <laughs> <laughs> God is so good. <laughs> God is so good. She's so generous. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, for me, I feel like it's also educating women. But And as you educate them, they create other platforms. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a hub or it's... Um, an idea, you know, um, there are so many industries that have come up that you see women playing roles. Now, we have more female CEOs in the banks than we've had in the last decade. And that's something inspirational. Look at the top 10 or, or the top five um, big um, investors or, yeah, I'll, I'll call them investors in, in the movie industry. They are women. You have Jade, you have Funkad, Kindele. They are all women. Mm -hmm. And why? Because one person decided that, okay, this is achievable, you know. And so that way you're inspiring other people to take bigger steps and, you know, just kind of networking and building that um mm -hmm. The, uh, what do you do now? <laughs> just <laughs> you know, just just making it go go around and build that sort of um, network network or you know whatever it is that that allows or yeah that that goes that word that actually encourages women to mm. play in this field more of creating wealth other than you know mm -hmm. yeah you can sell your tomato 
but there's nothing wrong in selling tomato but there's a bigger picture can can you package it in a way and ex and export it that takes a lot of education and then enlightenment you, absolutely mm. and you're exporting you're not re um, earning in fx mm. right that we're looking for in nigeria yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. so there's no job that is useless in my own opinion you know the other day i was seeing i saw something on charcoal right on coal right imagine how many women can invest in that or actually be you know there, there's so much to do so it's not necessarily the work in itself it's the education to know how we can create more mm. Emma, it looks like that's your salary job is not going to be enough hey. mommy is going to push you harder me i'm you need... pushing myself hard so which area are you looking at Right now, currently, I'm looking into healthcare because that's where my passion is. Oh, but nice. I also have different like hobbies, and I plan to use all. So I feel like I'm very multidimensional. So I like different different things, and I believe that as like a person, you can't make money from one. Like you can't just have one stream of income. So, so I want to have a hair of... business. I want to have my cooking. Yeah, so like so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I still want my health care. Okay. <laughs> that sounds yeah. reasonable, the, the health care one. Yeah. I mean, there's so many aspects to, yeah. to it yes. now, providing yeah. services. Yes. I think the other day I spoke to a lady who all she does is she makes an app or an, a, a device available mm. if there's an emergency. Oh, wow. She okay. makes a what? Either an app or a yeah, device. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. So if there's an emergency, anybody has an emergency, if you subscribe to that, you can reach the hospital. You can get the attention of yeah. the hospital. Oh, wow. You know, okay, so you yes, have all those lovely. elderly people who are at yeah. home alone. Mm -hmm. You know, they press a button and there's a hot, you I know, love it. and things like that. So yeah. great things. But thank you so much, mother and daughter. Oh, thank you. Oh, my God. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. But why do we're so proud of you? Well done, the work you have done. and I know your daughter will do better than you. She That's better. what we all pray for. That's what I would. So thank you so thank much, you, Angela, and Emerald, for your time. Wish you the best. Thank I'm you. looking out for your health yes. business. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, let's take a break now. When we come back, we we'll head to the market to stay with us. Welcome back to Watching Business Incorporated on Channel Television. We head to the markets now with Aniti Edit. Aniti? Yes. Good afternoon, Ini. Good afternoon. Um, third day of October, but second trading day. And then, of course, we started uh, the month of October in the red. Of course, as you can take a look at your board there, that red ain't going nowhere. And that's no thanks to profit-taking uh, by investors across uh, the banking counter, the oil and gas counter. Yesterday, we saw Owando uh, printing uh, a negative picture there. It was down by about 6.78%. Uh, UBA was down by 4.59%. FBN Holdings, Access Core. So we had about 32 losers uh, taking off this, taking the shine off from 25 gainers. And so we see, we see the market receding below the 98,000 points to 97,059.87 points at intraday. And then, of course, like we always say, these numbers are still within session before the market closes at 2.30 Nigerian time. For the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, 0.76%, as you can see there, 86,000. We saw some profit taking. That market had reached about some 87,000 points. But of course, it's also on the side of um, the Nigerian stock market still receding. And talk about, talk about the Nigerian stock market. Yesterday, there was a, a collaboration announced between the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as the Nigerian Exchange Limited and the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, all in aim to deepen uh, the relationship and uh, market development. So that's just about the three, uh, the, the three regulators, uh, one of the regulators and the two markets on two of Africa's biggest, uh, big, biggest economies. Now, still within the African um, continent, EJX30 up by 0.47% at intraday, while the Nairobi Stock Exchange closed for uh, Wednesday uh, up by 0.34%. 107.68, that was the number for the close of Wednesday's trading session. And from Africa, we go over to the Middle East, where we see uh, negative performance taking, uh, taking a hit on all the markets across the Middle East. There we see from the United Arab Emirates, uh, the, the South, uh, Saudi Arabia's Tadal Wool, as well as uh, the, the, the markets on the Qatari Stock Exchange. So we see negative picture for the Middle Eastern markets there. Uh, and this is all because of the Iran-Israeli conflict, which is escalating uh, following that um, barrage of missiles, which was fired by Israel against, um, uh, 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 against 
uh, fired by Iran against Israel. And of course, the world is still awaiting for what will be the full response of Israel since they've carried out ground operations. And from the Middle East, we go over to the United States, where the stock futures edge lower. And this is coming as uh, the, the investors there are awaiting the jobs report, as well as uh, new labor market report with the release of initial jobless claims, which will be due out for Thursday. But for the U.S. markets, um, uh, this is the September job report that will be out on Friday. So the market is in a frenzy about how that, um, that uh, report will be coming out. And of course, the market is also looking ahead towards the November meeting of the, 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 of the U.S. Federal Reserve's where, uh, of course, they've already hinted, Jerome Powell, that's the, the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, has already hinted that there will be more cuts, but slightly is going to be uh, in, in the lower bits for the, uh, for the interest rate cuts. But as far as the markets that we track on the U.S. markets, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, is just up by a tad 0.09%. S&P futures a tad 0.01%, and the Nasdaq uh, tech uh, tech average was up by 0.08 percent these numbers will see how the how the markets will open for trading for thursday at about 2:30 nigerian time and then finally for the asian markets we see the indexes were clo they closed a thursday's trading session slightly mixed we see japan taking most of the lead there 1.97 percent yesterday we saw japan market was was one of the biggest losers there but uh, for for the close of Thursday trading session, we see it in the green, and this is coming after the new uh, Prime Minister, Shigeru Ishiba, uh, he told uh, reporters that economic conditions do not currently support another rate hike, uh, and he, uh, he made this comment after he met with the Bank of Japan Governor, Kazuo Ueda, so that comment is part of what revved the market uh, performance. For the KOSPI, South Korea's um, short, uh, stock market is shot for the close of Thursday trading session, but the market was down by 1.22%. Hang Seng Index down by 1.47%. While we see Shanghai uh, in China is still uh, a public holiday there, but the market will be resuming on October the 8th. So it's still the last track that we had there. And then for the uh, India's uh, Nifty 50, it was in the red. So any, that's a wrap for most of the markets that we track at intraday and for the close of Thursday's trading session. Thank you so much, Anite. Pleasure. All right, uh, we just uh, stopped a bit at uh, Berlin because today it marks 34 years of reunited Germany after the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989. The former socialist Eastern Germany merged with Western Germany today, then um, in 1990, October 3. But over three decades later, there are still a lot of differences between the West and the East. Uh, Lars uh, has the details of this. Hi, Lars. Uh, what can you tell us about the economic differences between this East and West 30 years after? Thanks for having me. Well, 34 years after reunification, there are indeed huge differences and they've been frustrating, even painful for people in the eastern part of Germany because they are generally poorer. There's fewer jobs there. Wages are lower, retirement benefits too. All that had been promised to be raised to Western German standards. And of course, wages and benefits have indeed been raised, but not yet to the level the West has. And one can easily say that people in the east didn't think it would take more than a generation for them to be on somewhat equal footing. Also, and that's maybe the biggest difference, there are obviously companies and jobs in the eastern part of Germany too, but all of the big ones are in the West, including literally all of those 40 companies listed as a German blue chips. Now, some argue that it's not about East and West so much as it is about a split between urban and rural Germany, and that's certainly true. In fact, all the big cities are located in West Germany. Now, Berlin is obviously an exception, but then further down the list, you have Leipzig and Dresden ranking 10th and 12th. Only two of Germany's 25 largest cities are in the East. But uh, be that as it may, it certainly doesn't help people in Eastern Germany cope with the fact that they're still not equal to Western Germans in an economic way. Yeah, well, the difference seems to the dragging, you know, for many decades. Well, thank you so, so much, uh, Lars, for that. And we'll come back to Afro Africa, where Kenya's monthly inflation rate eased to 3.6% in September 2024, amid an increase in food and non-food commodity prices. Latest data from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics shows that the country's inflation dropped 
from 4.4% in August to 3.6% last month, September. The year-on-year -year inflation rate as measured by the Consumer Price Index as the CPI is to 3.6% in September. And this means that the general price level was 3.6% higher in September 2024 than it was the same time 2023. The price increase was mainly driven by hike in prices of commodities on the food and non-alcoholic beverages, contributing 5.1%. Housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fields contributed 2.6%. Transport, 0.5% uh, between September 2023 and 2024. Well, for one way or the other, news of ease in price is welcome from anywhere. And we hear that the price of wheat may be reducing soon. But let's find out what our financial derivatives company has discovered about this. The details of it will be shared by Emi Fene Onyeluka Chuku, is an analyst with financial derivatives company. Hi, um, Onyeluka Chuku. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on the program. So what's this we hear, uh, the trend of wheat prices at this time? Thank you, Ini, for having me. Currently, consider wheat prices have been rising Consider wheat prices have been rising globally. This is as a result of drought, drought in <coughs> as a result of drought in key producing nations such as Russia and Ukraine. However, the EIU has forecasted that global wheat prices is going the average wheat price that global wheat price is going to fall to two hundred and sixty six dollar to a ton as a result of improved production, improved production from US and Canada, as well as tepid demand from EU countries. However, we can see that in Nigeria currently, we can see that, however, in Nigeria, currently in Nigeria, we are seeing that, we are seeing that, we see that which related products such as flour has to decline. For example, we have flour, which has declined to 65,000 Naira to a bag, from 70,000 Naira to a bag. This is as a result of improved wheat production, we can see in Nigeria, due to initiatives such as the Agricultural Transformation Agenda, and as well as the recent import duty waiver by the federal government of Nigeria to tame inflationary pressures in the country, and also low demand from low demand from consumers due to price instability in the country, which is also weighing on their disposable income. But we are seeing that prices of but since the prices of flour is expected to fall by the end of 2024 due to this import um, due to this import duty waiver. All right, um, uh, it seems, uh, uh, um, I wonder what's going on right there. But thank you so much uh, for your time, Mefene Onyeluka Chuku, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you for sharing the findings of FDC with us this afternoon. Now, let's um, that much promised highlight of the almost four hour celebration of Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary, which Channel Television um, had. And um, it was, well, the eggheads in the economic sector in Nigeria, private sector, public sector. Well, we'll bring you we'll capture that in this uh, couple of minutes to share with you in case you couldn't watch it on October the 1st. Well, Channel's and forum with the theme, Nigeria's uh, challenging economy, here, strategies for recovery, um, is how Nigeria's home for the news, the channel's world. television, has decided to celebrate Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary. About Spotlighting critical aspects of the economy but that I, impact I the welfare we of citizens, the, the area of focus is ensuring food security. At, the Deputy Governor of Lagos, Dr. Dr. Kadri Hamzat, shares some achievements and plans of the state. Their, their produce and everything. The cost of logistics has gone down by 40% because they can get a trailer and then they're moving. Also because there's dry storage, there's wet storage and so on. They can actually store so the, 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 their products. So tomatoes stay longer because it can be stored there if it's not sold. So that's what Lagos intends to do. Partnership with other states that has the land 
After all, people come to Lagos to build their houses. We can also go there to go and farm in other states. And then two, make sure that we have enough market to aggregate and also reduce the effect of the middlemen. Uh, Another member of the panel the is the Commissioner for Agriculture in Kaduna State, Dr. Muktala Dabo, who hinges Nigeria's economic rules so on the nucleus of the country. The suffering, the economic stress is simply because we abandoned agriculture. And as we are now, as a strategy for recovery, what we need to do is to really refocus, which I believe the government is taking the right steps by refocusing on agriculture, because once productivity grows there, is the only way, because you need, first of all, to ensure food security. Food sufficiency is key. Without it, I mean, the stress will be enormous, which we all are, are feeling right now. Mechanized farming is a strength of Oshun State, according to the Commission of Agriculture and Food Security, Mr. Tola Fashiru. Days of old um, cutlasses and O's, uh, how far can, can we go with that? When we got there, we, we didn't we practically saw no, 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 no tractors, no equipment on the ground. But he said, we can, we can work this way. And he went ahead to do that investment in mechanization. But all of this will be lost if insecurity persists in the sector. We we'll need to increase our strategy to make sure that the, since the leaders of this gang have been decimated, the younger ones do not come and form other groups to come and create problems for farmers so that we we'll get sufficient food for our country. To close out the session, actionable steps were collated to include states should collaborate in area of storage and logistics, reduce the number of middlemen in agricultural value chain, refocus on agriculture, and bridge the gap between farmers and the government. The next panel is on energy security, but the first speaker, Vice Chair of Africa Energy Council, Dr. Chin Andikwa, is quick to state that areas of priority should be refocused. Nigeria started importing crude in 1972. Nigeria is 64 years old today. So the problem is only about 12 years younger than Nigeria. So to your point, do we have a refinery? Yes, we do today. There's a huge opportunity to solve that problem, that 52-year-old problem. So from an energy security standpoint, it's huge. You know, whichever side of the divide that you see, it is a huge thing that today we could solve that. But I always say, before we talk about energy security, I think that's the way we need to frame this question. Before you say energy security, before you secure anything, you have to have it first. So actually, the point I'm making is, there are three sides to this coin. It's not two sides, there are three sides. The first side of the coin is energy access. Do we even have this energy? You walk out of here, probably not today, but certainly a month ago, two months ago, you see long queues. Does the energy even exist? Do we even have it? So energy access is number one, and there was a recent study by one of our analysts. If you take the average taxi driver, say in Lagos, he spends, believe it or not, a minimum of 72 hours in the petrol station queuing a month. 72 hours queuing. Sum that up into a year, probably works out to be about 35 days. That's about 10% of his year, just queuing. Non-productivity, that man can be working, contributing to the economy, he's not, he's queuing, spending time, you know, all of that. So energy access, question one. If you do have the energy, then the second thing is energy affordability and leads to a question of price. And then attention turns to potentials in gas. Nigeria has the highest deposit of natural gas reserve in the whole of Africa. Nigeria has almost what? Almost about six trillion standard cubic meters of gas under the ground. So question of uh, availability shouldn't be our problem in Nigeria. We have abundance of gas. I'm taking this towards the direction of energy for transportation. For a thriving economy, people need to move from A to B. Goods need to move from A to B. So we need to move people around. So um, if, we, if we tap into our gas reserves, experts have it that our gas reserves 
will last anywhere from above 10 decades to 30 decades. But the issue of affordability is still top here. Affordability, purchasing power of Nigerians, a lot of the poor people in the village, we are not talking of cities, in the village, you gave a chat about the population distribution of Nigeria, about 35% in the village. Out of that 35%, only 5 or 2% are using LPG to cook, are using butane. So those one are out of the net. They don't have access and they can't afford it. The possibility of using both liquid fuel and gas is a more realistic approach for Nigeria. For every refinery that any refinery actually does, there is about 3% of gas coming out of it, which can also be trapped and converted and processed into LPG. I think, uh, like he mentioned Dangote in the past, I think Dangote was looking at even producing LPG into the market. I'm not sure if he still wants to do that. But for every refining process, there's always gas coming out, which of course can also be compressed and processed with the plant. And uh, LPG can also be produced into the market. And then the actionable steps, which include to deal with energy accessibility and affordability before security, boost adoption of CNG, diversify energy sources, and revive Nigeria's refining capacity. The final conversation looks at the ease of doing business and the reforms of President Bola Tinubu came up. Perhaps if we did not have these reforms, perhaps if on that day, the president did not say subsidy is gone, perhaps things would have been better. Well, um, let me say that, uh, I want to commend NNPC for what they are doing now. A lot of people do not know that um, PMS is being subsidized for us. I think about 200 and something naira on it. And that's why the position they are taking that they are buying from Dangote and selling to other marketers is actually to bridge the gap. I wish they could do more because subsidy is gone may not be the right description is actually subsidy have been reduced. So I would say that if they could reduce further, which is looking at um, the low hanging fruit that we talk about, because when you see the low hanging fruit, DG, Neka and the man said, the fruit is already on ground, like Taiwo also said. But the most dangerous thing is, um, if you don't have food in view, you can actually keep fasting and endure. But when there is a promise that this food is yours, then you begin to see the saliva, the movement, and you want to catch the food. That's why government need to now look at it and say, the promises that we are making, that comfort is coming, we then need to, government need to also be an additional cost. The reality of anything for anybody is, you know, they say leadership is by leading by example. If you tell me that I should tighten my belt, I need to see you too tighten some belt. It might not be as big as I am tightening, but at least I need to see a sign that you are tightening your So if I'm getting lean, you two have to follow. Now, but if you are getting fatter, and I'm getting lean. How query your sense of direction? Now, that's the reality we are in today. Let's just say that everybody believes that you're telling all of us to be lean. Now, the reality, just for what he said, on the case of a manufacturer, is even worse. That 100 million ton 25, believe me, 25 million cannot run inside that factory and make money to pay the salary. Mm. Because there's what is called a minimum capacity utilization of your processes, mm. which you must match. If, for instance, a factory needs to run at 40% minimum to break even, if it goes to 25, it is losing money because what is as it, happening is that the material going in is being eroded by the overhead. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a tough situation. Mm. Of, it let's be, you know, it's a, there is no way you can, um, there is no argument, and I, and I hope that those in the, in the policy arena also should, will, they will understand this. Even when you have a clear purpose, you know where you are going, you know the type of the uh, economic uh, problems that you want to solve. We see, I believe we still need to have a kind of um, 
uh, an idea that will help us to minimize the cost from the other side. He has mentioned typical case of the inflation and uh, an interest rate. Um, for me and for uh, colleagues, even in the private sector with man, I think the, um, the stabilization bill is, is, is one of the things we think can change, can change the narration. And it was, was also a, a positive for us when the committee was formed, the presidential committee. Um, it takes a, a, an administration with, with um, some level of guts to get that kind of team together to actually review the kind of things they've reviewed, to make the kind of recommendation, fundamental recommendations that they've made. And um, whether it was circumstantial or whether it was... Um, whether it was deliberate, yeah, the fact that the committee has worked assiduously and come up with those recommendations, which we have um, to a large extent adopted in the private sector because of the far-reaching consequences, positive consequences of those, um, those recommendations, is for us to now push, ensure that those recommendations they don't go the way of uh, the same policies that you mentioned. And that comes back to building institutions that I mentioned earlier, that beyond politics. I think it's also time that we start advocating for economic institutions that are independent, irrespective of a government that comes in. Um, so there are two very important policies of the government that people blame for the economic hardship. One of it is the first subsidy reduction and then the flotation of the Naira. And I think we have to come to a realization that the conversation or the debate should not be about whether those things should have been done or whether it would have been better if we had retained what we had before. That was not an option. Um, take the FS, for example. We're owing over 7 billion backlog. So it was actually a subsidy regime. FS subsidy regime was what we had. We had borrowed billions of dollars against our reserve. We're not even sure what the net was going to be. So the economy was collapsing. We didn't have the headroom to continue with that. I believe that if we had sustained that regime, we would be in a worse situation today than we are now. Um, the subsidy reduction, if we had sustained it, the government was spending about 96% of their revenue just to service debt, and they were printing money to do everything else. When you keep printing money, the impact will be more devastating than what we have now. So that's also not an option. So the debate should be, are there other ways we could have done it, not whether we should have done it? I think that's very fundamental. If I want to sum it up, because I know our time is up, it's that the major problem we have today, the challenge, biggest challenge to the economy is the FX. If we can get FX to under 1,000, you have the impact everywhere. Inflation will come down, band A tariff will be maybe like half, you're going to have a lot of things would improve. What the data is showing us is that between June 14 last year, when Naira was floated, and now, we've actually received net inflow of FX. Yet our Naira has lost more value. So what we find is that we have significant illicit demand. You need to find a way to take that illicit demand out of the market so you can have only just legitimate demand. And the diaspora remittances of about 20 billion we see about four to five within the official market. About 15 billion is being either externalized or finding its way to the black market. So the, the plan we're trying to do now is for the fiscal to complement the monetary to address this issue so that by this time next year, we have more good news to share and not what we're planning to do, but what we have done. The agreed solutions here include build economic institutions independent of politics, strengthening the Naira below 1,000 Naira for a dollar, regulatory harmonization, which is critical, and then custom service rate should be fixed. At the end of the conversations, an anniversary cake is cut. So there you have it. That's the way Channel Television joined other Nigerians to celebrate 54 years of independence in the country. And we do hope that those points will resonate 
uh, in different quarters until something happens. So it's almost time to leave the program, but uh, let's just see the numbers for crypto. So the program is complete today. We see that Bitcoin is still in the red. It's down 0.8% at $60,818.37. Ethereum is also still in the red. Uh, a lot of uncertainty going on in the market as uh, investors are looking forward to that data coming from the United States. And we know that this market, the crypto market, reacts a whole lot to that. We have some uh, top stories also in the crypto space. We can only just read out. Uh, unfortunately, the Securities and Exchange Commission has filed a notice to appeal the overturn of Ripple's landmark ruling. I remember that Ripple's landmark ruling. It's been, uh, it was a big news then. Now uh, they're trying to overturn that. So we should be discussing, you know, the impact of that on uh, both ripples and then uh, the tokens and then uh, the general market but I, we, we don't have time for that so the impact of that on the broader crypto market um, I hope we'll be able to do that tomorrow but that's it on the program thank you so much for doing this 55 minutes journey with me and us right here in the studio we'll do it again tomorrow God's grace I'm Amy John McQuire enjoy the rest of your day